Hello and welcome. This is Taya Stay, your host of To Your Health series, broadcasting from World Pleasure Network. I'm delighted and excited to present engaging, in-depth conversation with my very credible guests who are leaders, researchers, authors in the field of advanced nutrition, biochemistry, emotional intelligence, energy-based medicine, and mind-body connection, which orchestrates our state of health, energy levels, and inner happiness. Every show is designed to give you the bottom line in practical information on ways to optimize your physical, emotional, and mental aspects of your well-being and your life. And I personally invite you to step up and make it your goal to become the optimal you by managing your number one resource, your energy, of course, to your health and wellness. Hello again, this is Taya from... World Pleasure Network broadcasting for To Your Health. And with me, I have Raymond Pete. And just a brief introduction. Um, Raymond is an author. He's written Nutrition for Women, Four Editions, Mind and Tissue, Two Editions, Progesterone in Orthomolecular Medicine, Two Editions, and Generative Energy. He also has two patents for progesterone and intercostal, 1984, DHEA and other steroids for arthritis, 1986, and the use of steroids in treatment of osteoporosis and other degenerative diseases. He received his PhD in progesterone and related hormones in 1972, and that was actually a very interesting story how they came about. So I'm really looking forward to putting Raymond in the hot seat and literally picking his brain at simplifying some very complicated topics on foundational hormones. Raymond, hello. Hello. How are you doing? Very good. Fantastic. So you did your PhD because you really wanted to study science. You really wanted to dedicate yourself to something where you could discover something new. Uh, yeah, it had been... Uh, studying interesting stuff, uh, just trying to understand how the world works. And so I had specialized in linguistics, literature, painting, and uh, things that I was interested in. But I decided I should uh, make knowledge useful. And uh, I was around the age of 30, I think, when I decided that uh, useful knowledge was uh, the really the purpose of the brain. Mm. Uh, and you're now 73, is that correct? Yes. And you're still pursuing knowledge? And what? And you're still pursuing knowledge? Oh, oh yeah. Um, that's why I do a newsletter every two months, uh, because I'm, I'm still trying to get the big picture uh, more sharply focused. Yes. I have actually read all your articles, just about all your articles on your website. Some of them I've read two or three times because I really, really wanted to understand um, the the complexity that you simplified and you just said in a couple of sentences. And what really fascinated me was the, the foundational hormones, the pregnenolone, progesterone, and the estrogen. I could not find that information anywhere, and I have been researching that. Um, for personal reasons and for my clients. And I find that people really need to understand foundational hormones to see the bigger picture. And your thesis was actually energy interrelated with structure. That was the purpose of, of you doing that. Can you take us into the world of foundational hormones and why do we need them and what are they? Um, I, I have been uh, working in Mexico for several years, and uh, when I moved uh, back to the U.S., um, I started noticing the effects of the weather on my health and especially on uh, young women's health. Uh, in the winter uh, at the university, uh, lots of students would uh, spend most of their, their time indoors and uh, sometimes uh, get no sun at all for several months at a time. And I started seeing uh, symptoms like premenstrual 
syndrome and the depression that came on in the winter. And uh, people uh, who had never uh, experienced those symptoms uh, until they came to Eugene, which is a very cloudy place in the winter, uh, I started realizing that the uh, sunlight is a major factor in uh, allowing us to produce and use uh, certain hormones. And uh, progesterone is the, um, the main hormone that's needed for both brain development and fertility. Um, and uh, sunlight, uh, the reason animals um, are fertile in the spring is because the sunlight, uh, as the days get longer, uh, the anti-stress hormones increase, and uh, that's mainly progesterone that increases in the spring, um, causing the brain to uh, uh, function uh, more with with greater variety and uh, energy, and it allows uh, fertility to uh, be carried uh, to completion. And, so, uh, so that would be vitamin D. That would be which is also a pro hormone. Uh, well, uh, that that is one of the factors in sunlight. Um, the uh, vitamin D allows us to absorb and use calcium. And calcium holds down uh, the uh, some of the basic stress hormones that tend to put us into a, a torpid hibernation state uh, when it's too dark. Uh, the um, the hormones that make people uh, uh, depressed and sick in the winter are the same hormones that allow uh, animals in nature to go into torpor or hibernation. Uh, when the days are very short. And uh, progesterone is uh, the uh, the main anti-stress hormone that is inhibited uh, if we're deficient in either calcium or vitamin D. Uh, when vitamin D and calcium are, are not adequate in either the diet or or the exposure to the environment, uh, cells go into an excited, inefficient state, and uh, they have to be quieted and, and put into a torpor by uh, various uh, other hormones. Uh, progesterone uh, keeps us out of that state, but, but to do it, you need um, to have um, your calcium under control. and. It isn't just the vitamin D that regulates calcium. It's the energy of, uh, produced in the mitochondria uh, under the influence of uh, good hormones and good nutrition. The mitochondria um, produce energy that keeps calcium out of cells and uh, in the bones where it should be. Um, and if, you, if you're deficient in vitamin D and, and calcium, uh, the hormones allow it to get into the mitochondria and poison them. But if, if the days are very long, even if you don't have vitamin D, the light that penetrates into your tissues um, is mostly red and yellow light, and that light um, happens to quench the free radicals that damage the mitochondria. And so it's, it's um, basically a, a low energy state that um, is caused by a deficiency of sunlight um, and or vitamin D mm -hmm. and or calcium. Uh, so we actually require the ultraviolet light from the sun to synthesize vitamin D, is that correct? Yes, and and also the red light to uh, quench free radicals that are produced by stress. Yes, and so the if we go out in the sun in the morning, early morning, or probably after five, we will not be getting enough ultraviolet light. So therefore, even though we're getting the sun, we're actually not getting the synthesis for vitamin D. Is that correct? 
Uh, well, we're getting the anti-stress effect. Mm -hmm. So um, if you get enough calcium and other nutrients, uh, you can really get along with an extremely low uh, vitamin D intake or synthesis. Uh, they've done experiments with animals um, in which they gave them a, a diet lacking vitamin D and low in calcium, but mm -hmm. when they gave them uh, sugar rather than starch, uh, simply the uh, energy efficiency of the sugar allowed them to build strong bones and avoid rickets. Uh, so uh, it's much more complex than, than just uh, taking uh, vitamin D. It's the, the whole uh, balance of nutrients. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And um, you do talk about sugar um, or glucose and starch, and some people actually don't know the difference. Carbohydrates are carbohydrates, and there are different types of carbohydrates. What do you mean by starch and sugar? Um, well, in one of the um, basic uh, lab experiments that physiology professors uh, have traditionally given their students, um, that you would feed a, a, a rat with a stomach tube a, a huge gob of uh, cornstarch or other uh, pasty starch mixed with a little water, uh, the equivalent of about a quart for a person. And then you would wait five minutes and you were instructed to find how far the starch had moved in the digestive system. And in just 10 minutes, the students would find no trace of starch. It had been totally dissolved, turned into sugar, and absorbed in 10 minutes, even though it was the equivalent of a quart for a human being. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, starch is a chain of glucose molecules. And so if you eat a, a given amount of of energy or calories in the form of starch, what you get is a, an instantaneous blast of glucose. If you eat the same um, amount of energy in the form of sucrose, just plain granulated sugar, uh, the absorption of uh, the sugar is slower. The uh, glucose stimulates insulin and tends to turn on fat production. Fructose slightly inhibits the production of of insulin, and slightly inhibits the uh, the blood sugar disturbing effect of the glucose. So and that's uh, that's kind of interesting because the cornstarch is very predominant in most foods these days. I mean, you would find cornstarch in the form of maltodextrin. And um, I personally tell people not to take that because even though it seems to be harmless, it actually does cause quite a high blood sugar increase. Not yeah, to mention the side effects of, you know, a little bit of gas and flatulence. And I think when people take that ingredient out of everything in their diet, there's enormous improvement. Yet it seems so innocent because it's added to everything, maltodextrin as a cornstarch. Yeah, if, if the starches are instantly absorbed, as in the rat experiment, uh, they cause obesity. <clears throat> and if they're uh, mixed with other ingredients so that they are more slowly absorbed, then they are fermented <clears throat> in the intestine. And uh, that type of slowly uh, digested starch was found to cause animals to become fearful and aggressive. Mm. because of the toxic effect produced by fermentation in the intestine. So that's a classic of we are what we eat, and often we don't realize the effect that food has on our moods, our brain chemistry, energy level, because we think if we could buy from a supermarket, if it's been promoted on television, it's harmless. And yet a lot of the times it actually does impact our health, even interferes with hormone production. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Um, sugar uh, is needed to, um, for the liver to activate the thyroid hormone, which is what produces the um, energy that prevents stress and 
regulates minerals and growth and so on. And uh, if if someone tries to um, eat a low carbohydrate diet, uh, or if they eat only starches so that their blood sugar is is going up and down very quickly, um, their thyroid uh, doesn't function properly. Sugar mm. is the essential ingredient for about 70% of our thyroid function, which is uh, it involves the liver's activation of thyroxin into the active thyroid hormone. And then without the um, active thyroid hormone, uh, none of the other, none of the steroid hormones can be made. So the adrenals, the ovaries, uh, and even the brain, which is a major source of steroids, uh, can't adequately produce the uh, protective steroids. And why do we need protective steroids? Um, it, the uh, steroids are a feature of all uh, life. Um, it, it's um, not really sufficiently studied exactly what uh, their their role is, but cholesterol, for example, um, is known to be involved <clears throat> in the uh, process of cell division, of uh, the expression of genetic information. Um, every function of life involves <clears throat> either cholesterol or one of the uh, steroids made from cholesterol. So it, it's um, some function that if a, if a cell is living and dividing, uh, it's going to need steroids. Mm. Um, very few people really know about pregnenolone. When I often mention it, um, because it's probably in my opinion, the safest one to take if you wanted to up up your boost of foundational hormones as we live in a world of stress. Stress is unavoidable, it's predictable, it's always there and some people are actually addicted to stress. We actually get addicted to the adrenaline. I think if that is what we do, then we probably need a boost of pregnenolone after the age of 40. Yet most people don't know probably because it can't be patented. Is that correct? Um, yeah, pre pregnenolone is the first hormone produced from cholesterol when our thyroid function is adequate. And I'd just like to emphasize it is made from the LDL, which is classified as the bad cholesterol. Is that correct? Yes. And so, uh, um, uh, cholesterol has been injected into animals, and um, when they're being trained, uh, they become more intelligent and learn more quickly when their cholesterol is higher. And in uh, the Framingham study, it was found that people at the age of 50 or more who don't have cholesterol um, above average, above the 200 milligrams per cent, which um, the ideal is supposed to be 160 or so. So it's slightly above what is considered optimal. Um, if they don't have at least that much cholesterol, they have a much higher risk of becoming demented. Uh, mm. so cholesterol is, is a very important brain uh, chemical, but one of its main functions is that the brain can turn it into pregnenolone and DHEA and progesterone in very large quantities. And if you're limited in your ability to turn it into those hormones, uh, taking pregnenolone bypasses one of the uh, steps. And so uh, you can sometimes see a tremendous improvement of a person's ability to cope uh, when they take just a little bit of pregnenolone. Yes, I have definitely uh, noticed that. And a few people that I have recommended um, to take pregnenolone, if they really, really needed it, they actually noticed improvements in their brain function within the first few days. And they just actually couldn't believe that it worked so fast. Um, if we are avoiding cholesterol and if we are avoiding eggs, most people are shocked um, to, to eat two or four eggs a day, which is kind of makes sense because the egg yolk has everything you need to make pregnenolone. Um, so if they're only having two eggs a week, 
that obviously would be deficient in pregnenolone and probably progesterone. Is that correct? Um, well, you can make um, make a cholesterol if you have enough uh, of all of the other nutrients. Um, uh, such as? Um, I recommend uh, drinking a quart or two of orange juice per day for a person who wants to bring their cholesterol up quickly. It's much more efficient than eating a dozen eggs. <laughs> uh, yes, I don't think eggs actually raise cholesterol as most people are being um, trained or through media to believe. And I do think that probably a high sugar diet or carbohydrate would, would raise cholesterol triglycerides faster than anything. Um, if, if people are lowering their cholesterol, which is the aim of, you know, we should all have low cholesterol, I don't agree with that, then they would be avoiding the very things they need. So what other things could they take in terms of supplements? Uh, well, vitamin A is the main cofactor uh, for um, thyroid to be able to turn cholesterol into those hormones. And that's and, vitamin E from animal sources? Uh, yes. Um, in the 1930s, uh, one of the um, signs for um, diagnosing hypothyroidism was a progesterone deficiency. And uh, when uh, some of these women who had had uh, severe symptoms of high estrogen and, and low uh, progesterone, when some of them had their ovaries removed, the corpus luteum, which means the yellow body where progesterone is synthesized, uh, these uh, parts of the ovary were found to be bright red. They had accumulated uh, carotene in place of vitamin A, and carotene at that high concentration competes uh, for the uh, enzymes that use vitamin A, and so it has a, an anti-vitamin A function. And unless people eat things like chicken livers and, once again, egg yolks, or take cod liver oil, which is not very pleasant, they're probably not getting enough vitamin A from that retinol source? Um, yes. Um, if your metabolic rate is high, uh, your vitamin A requirement is very high because you will be producing large amounts of pregnenolone and progesterone, and that uses up vitamin A very quickly. Um, mm. Sometimes uh, people notice that in bright, sunny weather, uh, they'll get acne or dandruff or uh, some some of the annoying little symptoms. And uh, the, if they just take a, a big supplement of vitamin A and uh, watch their thyroid, because vitamin A can inhibit the thyroid function, um, if those are in balance, then you're able to make uh, the amount of, uh, of progesterone and pregnenolone that you need to um, respond to the, the long uh, summer days. Mm. So you had some very interesting um, experiences yourself when you were um, implementing some of those um, steroidal hormones like DHEA. I mean, that's quite amazing. I have read um, that you grew one and a half inches at the age of 46. Now, did you really need to grow? Um, yeah, I had grown up in Oregon, and um, the, the the winters um, in all parts of Oregon are pretty dark and stressful. And uh, I didn't know that I was hypothyroid or, or lacking in hormones because, um, for example, when I would work in the woods, I would eat um, sometimes over 10,000 calories per day. Mm. I, I ate tremendous amounts and didn't get fat, so it took me a long time to realize that I could be hypothyroid and still have such an extremely high metabolic rate. Um, but uh, when I when I did try taking thyroid, I found that my rate of metabolism decreased sharply. It did something to increase my efficiency, which was probably increasing my production of uh, progesterone and pregnenolone. And uh, so that led to uh, a series of other experiments in which I uh, tried taking each of the hormones uh, individually. And uh, some doctor friends had noticed uh, 
what they thought was a melanoma uh, mm-hmm. growing, uh, growing very fast. It was looked like an arrowhead, irregular and uh, rapidly enlarging. And I, I didn't intend to uh, have it removed, but I was watching it. And it happened just a few days after I began taking the DHEA. That thing flared up and uh, within about three days was gone. And uh, around the same time, I noticed that my wisdom teeth, which had uh, started to erupt when I was around the age of 18 or 20, had just stayed, uh, never finished erupting for uh, 25 years, roughly. And within a couple of weeks of taking a small amount of DHEA, they began rotating and in just, uh, I guess, a total of about a month, they were uh, per- perfectly oriented, uh, vertical rather than uh, submerged and sideways. Mm. Uh, that's really quite motivating and, in- and inspirational to want to make people go and take a little bit of DHEA, and you only recommend one to two milligrams a day, which is infinitesimal, which is a tiny amount compared to most supplements started. 12 milligrams, uh, 25, 50, even go to 100. Yeah, teenage boys only make uh, about 12 milligrams per day at the maximum. Um, And uh, so if you take uh, 10 milligrams when you're only 30 or 40, uh, some of it is likely to be turned into estrogen. Mm. So when when people are buying these supplements, because... In America, you could pretty much get DHEA over the counter. Um, not knowing all of this, and if they were to get 25 milligrams, it's, is it likely that they're actually not really getting the pharmaceutical grade? That maybe they'd be best at best they'd be getting five milligrams. Well, I, mean, I think they should just cut the, the tablet in fractions and just go by what the label says, but uh, cut it down so that they're only taking about two to five milligrams per day. Mm. Um, When buying supplements or looking through supplements, it's always important to see, you know, what the company stands for. That's, um, it's a kind of reliable measure. And I think for me personally, if I look at other fillers and things that shouldn't be there in some other formulas, I probably tend not to go with that company. Um, and at the same time, there are very, very few that really do use pharmaceutical grade that you can rely on. Do you have any favorites that you can recommend? And um, if you have patents, may I ask why you have not come up with your own formulas? Oh, uh, well, I did uh, sell uh, the, some of the DHEA dissolved in, in the vitamin E, which makes it a, a very uh, quick-acting and controllable form that will circulate and uh, uh, distribute itself without uh, affecting your liver. If you take it in the the crystalline powdered form, uh, your liver will get the uh, first opportunity to uh, metabolize it, and that's when it it most easily turns into estrogen. But Mm. if it's dissolved completely in oil, uh, if you uh, don't mind eating extra olive oil or coconut oil or butter, for example, you can um, meld a few milligrams in a spoonful of that. But if you're taking just a plain DHEA capsule or tablet as one would have from, you know, everyday supplier, if you're not taking it with some sort of oil such as olive oil, vitamin E, then your your liver will have to work really hard. Is that what you're saying, Raymond? If you take it with the oil, that helps to uh, keep it from going into the liver. Okay. It helps to absorb it into the general uh, circulation uh, dissolved in the oil. What if they just take pregnenolone and don't worry about the DHEA? Would would that do it? Uh, that's best, I think. That Several years ago, I, I stopped uh, giving people any DHEA because they tended to feel so good They would uh, keep taking more and more Mm. of it until uh, one person enlarged his liver and and had the uh, estrogen level of a a teenage girl. Mm. 
and uh, that uh, effect can uh, cause a lot of long-range problems. Uh, Speaking so of, I, speaking I, of I, yes. I shifted to um, recommending that almost everyone use pregnenolone instead of DHEA because um, you can, in, in animal experiments, rats were given a 10 gram dose of uh, pure pregnenolone and then their hormones were examined and it did nothing to the hormones of uh, happy, healthy rats. But if the rat was under stress, it lowered the stress hormones. So it, no matter how much you take, uh, that would be like about two cups of powdered pregnenolone for a, a human. Uh, even that much doesn't disturb your hormones. And if you're under stress, it will uh, r r remove the, um, the stress hormones. So is there such a thing as taking too much pregnenolone? Uh, well, uh, for an experiment, I ate a kilogram of uh, pregnenolone spread over a year. Uh, that averaged out to about 3,000 milligrams a day. And I felt uh, great all that year. I could eat anything I wanted to, and uh, my metabolism just uh, was ideally regulated. But uh, the only reason I didn't keep it up was it's very expensive. Yes. And where do you get your pregnenolone these days? I haven't been using it. I've been working on on how to in, increase my own production of it by uh, adjusting the the foods. That would be fascinating. Um, and how how is progress? Um, very good. Um, I I use a small amount of of a thyroid supplement such as Cytomel or, or Stenomel. A T3 supplement, mm -hmm. and and then I uh, emphasize uh, sodium, calcium, and uh, the um, the sugary fruits in my diet, and uh, try to get a lot of gelatin. Um, and by keeping the ratio of calcium to phosphorus very high, and uh, having a slight excess of sodium, either in the form of table salt or baking soda, mm -hmm. uh, that helps to regulate all the other minerals uh, so that uh, uh, you don't have to worry so much about uh, getting enough magnesium. Uh, many, many foods are um, very low in magnesium, but if you eat extra sodium, your body uh, retains almost all of the magnesium that you give it. So coffee is very high in magnesium, is that correct? Yeah, that's my uh, main but, source of ma magnesium. So you drink coffee, and I did read an interesting article about um, your perspective on caffeine and, and how it actually helps with the brain function, and it inhibits um, adenosine, something to do with affecting other neurotransmitters. And of course, if our neurotransmitters are balanced, it's like we're more balanced. And um, it's perfectly normal to have two or three cups of coffee a day. Is that correct? Yes. Um, it doesn't hurt to drink 50 if if that is what balances your your metabolism. But I think it's um, everyone should uh, try to get from three to five cups a day. Uh, there have been studies in which people who drank more than five cups had lower incidences of various kinds of cancer. And, and lower incidence of dementia, too. So brain mm. protection and avoidance of cancer are probably the two most important things that coffee does. But it's anti-inflammatory and anti-stress and has a, a very broad range of protective effects. Except it does raise cortisol levels. So if one doesn't need the cortisol levels to be raised, um, which is the, the real stress hormone, they probably should limit their coffee one to two cups a day and how you can tell if your cortisol is high is that I read oh. somewhere if you're craving carbohydrates after you have a cup of coffee you're probably having too much yeah and by uh, adjusting all of your nutrients getting lots of, of 
uh, calcium from milk and cheese, for example, and uh, plenty of sugar from fruits in particular, um, the, um, those things all help to hold down your cortisol. And eating uh, small amounts at a, at a time will um, reduce your stress hormones too. Mm-hmm. So if someone's vegetarian, like if they're really a strict vegan, um, what would they need in mm-hmm. terms of foundational hormones and how to increase them? Um, well, vitamin A is the uh, the main problem uh, for a vegetarian because carotene can so easily uh, get in the way of vitamin A functions. I uh, learned that by a, a, a young man who was extremely sick and his doctors had found that he had practically no vitamin A in his blood but extremely high carotene, mm. which was blocking all of his hormones. And sometimes and, people get very orange hands if they actually have yeah. too much carotene. Yeah, and yeah. the carotene turns off your thyroid function very powerfully. Oh. And, um, in his case, all it took was one one dose of vitamin B12, which is needed to convert carotene to vitamin A. And within a week, his uh, symptoms had gone and his vitamin A level was normal. And uh, he was able to uh, convert the carotene to vitamin A easily. Yes, but, so a lot of vegetarian diets, unless they take vitamin B12 shots, probably don't have enough B12 because it needs to be synthesized um, in in the liver. It needs to be synthesized actually in, in the stomach. And yeah. And people think if they take spirulina or spinach and they're getting vitamin B12, it's actually nowhere near as effective as perhaps having egg yolks. Um, yeah, and any any little source of vitamin B12 can uh, keep a, a vegetarian in in good health as long as they avoid uh, too many of the toxins. Uh, many plants put out defensive substances. Um, some of which are specifically designed to block our digestive enzymes. Uh, the proteolytic enzymes, for example, are blocked by polyunsaturated fats. Mm. And it happens that it's a proteolytic enzyme in the thyroid gland that allows it to secrete hormone. And so the same thing that plants put in their, their seeds to prevent the seeds being digested by animals if that fat is absorbed and, and circulates in the bloodstream, it, it inhibits the secretion of thyroid hormone. Yes, so, so that is um, that is a very interesting point. I'd like to pause here because most people do consume far more polyunsaturated fats in terms of nuts. Most people think that protein is in nuts, and if they're vegetarian or they just think that if I have you know, 50 grams of almonds or cashews, I'm going to get some protein. And that's actually not really the complete protein, but it has a very high level of unsaturated fats which cause an underactive thyroid and cause estrogen dominance. Is that correct? Um, Yeah. Uh, About 30 years ago, I uh, ran into uh, a young woman who was wasting away, and uh, she tried to eat eggs and liver and all kinds of protein, but uh, she couldn't digest any protein and she was down to 65 pounds and was a fairly tall person. And uh, I had been reading about research with uh, some of the um, amino acid equivalents that are found in potatoes. Uh, Potato protein turns out to have a higher quality rank than egg yolk protein, and it's because of of these uh, equivalent substances that aren't quite amino acids all they need is ammonia. And when this woman ate uh, meat or eggs, uh, she would burp ammonia. And uh, something was was causing the protein to be short-circuited into a, an instant conversion to ammonia. And knowing about the, um, the research on potato uh, protein equivalents, I juiced some potatoes for her, made about a cup of the raw potato juice with all the starch removed and then cooked it like a scrambled egg. And she um, 
could eat it without the um, ammonia burps because it's very low in ammonia. But uh, from that meal, that single meal on, she went straight up to 130 pounds and right back to work. Mm. Since then, I've seen people who uh, had just extreme problems like inability to sleep for months at a time, uh, causing them to become demented. And uh, with one meal of uh, of the cooked potato juice, uh, one of these people went to sleep while eating the, the the bowl of potato juice soup. It it works so fast to energize the brain and start protein synthesis and repair. So if, if vegetarians will emphasize protein from potatoes and not worry about the nuts c- that contain mm-hmm. inhibitors, uh, you don't really assimilate any protein of value for many of the oily uh, nuts and seeds. And not um, to mention the, the whole polyunsaturated oils and canola oil and sunflower oil, which is so prevalent in 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 anything that we buy these days. And the, the good fat, the only fat that's really recommended is the coconut oil, the coconut fat, the saturated fat that most people are too scared to even try because in naturopathic community, alternative complementary medicine community, mainstream doctors always mention to stay away from saturated fats, especially coconut, and yet it's unique. It's so unique and it's underrated. And um, you write a lot about coconut oil, especially yeah. supporting the thyroid. Uh, one of the first studies I saw about it, um, they had fed, uh, I think there were 15 experimental groups of rats which got a low-fat diet, an average-fat or a high-fat diet, and each of the, of the diets consisted of either coconut oil or corn oil or a mixture. Uh, and um, it turned out that at the end of a normal lifespan, the fattest rats were the ones who had the unsaturated fats, either in a low-fat or high-fat diet. It didn't matter. It was the ratio of, of unsaturated to saturated that created the obesity. And the leanest animals were the uh, ones getting the coconut oil. Even in a high-fat diet, they were still the leanest. Mm. Well, I certainly get a buzz every time I have coconut oil. It's like an instant energy. And in winter, when it's really, really cold, that's when it's most noticeable. So I do find that that particular fat is used instantly for fuel, whereas other fats, you know, like lard and and beef tallow, probably not. Um, Fat is an energy. It's, I guess, the more fat we have in the diet that we can use, the more energy we have, the more heat. Uh, yeah, for quick, intense energy production, the shorter fats, as in coconut oil, are are most effective. But even the very long chain saturated fats uh, have specific protective biological functions. Uh, liver researchers are finding that um, alcoholics with hepatitis and cirrhosis can be cured if they completely eliminate the polyunsaturated fats such as fish oil, and replace them with absolutely saturated fat, such as uh, stearic acid and coconut oil. Yes, and of course, most of the time they're not advised that. So it's like really taking the basic chemistry 101 in in fats. And Mary Inig um, wrote a fantastic book. She actually did a PhD where she explained the breakdown and the carbon bonds in, in all the fats. And coconut fat was unique. It's like in a genre of its own. In fact, I think it says that it doesn't even require to be um, emulsified. It goes straight into the bloodstream and used for fuel. Um, yeah, the, the uh, mitochondria can use it directly uh, as if it were sugar for ease of, of producing energy. And it's really so nice. Coconut oil and coconut cream is just one of the the yummiest foods I think that are out there. And it's such a shame that they're given a bad name because they grouped into a saturated fat. And then saturated fat is actually quite a healthy thing. I mean, 50% of your heart 
is made of saturated fat. So why would we need it? Why would we need 50% of it around the heart? Um, well, there were studies about 30 years ago in which um, pregnant mice were fed uh, either corn oil or uh, coconut oil. And the babies that were exposed prenatally to corn oil had smaller brains and weren't very smart. And the, the babies that were exposed prenatally to coconut oil had actually bigger brains and were more intelligent. And uh, similar experiments have been uh, done on uh, dogs and other animals. It actually increases the brain size relative to the body size to, to have uh, plenty of saturated fats. Uh, they really are the essential fatty acids. Mm. It's a shame that these experiments have not been done on people. Um, because Well, uh, just recently, uh, a prenatal <clears throat> study was done on um, the trainability of the fetal heart rate. Um, they found that <clears throat> the, um, the fetus responds to conditions and uh, it there is both a short-term and a long-term uh, learning that can be demonstrated uh, stimulating the fetus at different ages uh, before birth. And uh, they compared the uh, intelligence of the fetus, the ability to learn, with the amount of um, fish oil in the diet and in the mother's tissues. And they found that the only two things that corresponded to better short-term and long-term memory was the absence of the um, common essential so-called fatty acids and of the long chain uh, fish oil type fatty acids. So a deficiency of those prenatally was just recently demonstrated to make the human fetus learn better. So is that being interpreted into no fish oil? In other words, fish oil is not as good as we've been made out to believe it is? Um, yes, there are many studies that people aren't being told about in which uh, fish oil <clears throat> increases metastatic cancer, um, has um, <clears throat> very serious immune suppressive effects that possibly relate to the, the fact that the cancer becomes more metastatic. Um, and is it because probably the fish oil is not really good quality, and if it doesn't have vitamin E, it oxidizes, goes rancid um, very quickly in our body. Would, is that, would that be part of it? Um, some experimenters found that the beneficial so-called effects of fish oil, which um, the anti-inflammatory effect is what most people are recommending it for, but they found that that anti-inflammatory action only exists after the oil has been oxidized, and it oxidizes very spontaneously so that by the time you swallow it and it gets in your bloodstream, it's almost always uh, oxidized. It um, used to be used for varnishes because it oxidizes and hardens so uh, spontaneously and thoroughly. And so, so the, the so-called beneficial effects really uh, are uh, associated with the breakdown products of it. So to summarize that, um, should we be taking fish oil with vitamin E, or should we just not worry about it and stick to salmon and sardines? Um, I even avoid salmon and sardines because of those uh, toxic effects of the oils. Mm. Um, it's um, just in the last two or three years, um, the effects of certain breakdown products in the brain, they're highly associated with uh, Alzheimer's type dementia. Um, and these, uh, they're called neuroprostanes and isoprostanes. And uh, their uh, origin can be traced directly to the essential fatty acids and the uh, DHA and EPA of fish oils, and uh, those have uh, some very special uh, involvement in producing Alzheimer's dementia. Mm. Mm. So 
if you look at at the prenatal effect and the Alzheimer's effect, uh, both ends are now uh, uh, incriminating uh, the the fish oil as a as a toxin. And in between, uh, what's most clearly established is that it's immunosuppressive. Well, that definitely defies the world of economics and all the wonderful mission statements that supplement companies make. So it's almost like we all really need to read widely and deeply to get to the bottom line of um, cellular energy. And speaking of energy, um, we're all advised to exercise. You know, doing aerobic exercise is one of the best ways to release energy if you're energetic. And yet, a lot of the times, it's actually kind of productive. Exercising for 40 or 50 minutes every day doing cardio will actually shut down the thyroid or reduce the thyroid gland. And you explain that in depth. Um, well, when you reach the, the threshold at which lactic acid rises, that's when you start feeling out of breath. Uh, the lactic acid has a pro-inflammatory effect, and uh, that goes with um, a falling blood sugar. Uh, the blood sugar is being suddenly consumed at a higher rate uh, because lactic acid uh, production is much less efficient than aerobic uh, oxidation. So when the lactic acid appears, the sugar is low, and you can't make your active thyroid hormone. And uh, if you're in very good health, your liver will be able to, uh, when you rest, your liver will get rid of the lactic acid. Your blood sugar will hopefully come back, and uh, your thyroid will be okay. But uh, uh, if your nutritional level isn't ideal, uh, sometimes just one episode of, of uh, lactic acid-producing exercise is enough to uh, knock you down into a lower metabolic state. So the difference between exercise that people define um, in high intensity, um, endurance, or even six-minute exercise where you just basically run uphill for 45 seconds, you rest for two minutes, and you repeat that, and that seems to build an enormous amount of lean muscle tissue and kind of keep the lungs and the heart expanded. Um, and there's a whole lot of debate. And in my personal experience, I've seen as a nutritionist and kinesiologist, I see people that are fatigued, they're exhausted, and they're actually putting on weight. And they can't lose weight because they're exercising too much. And they're convinced that they need to do something with their diet um, as opposed to cut down on exercise and change their form of exercise to suit the stress level because, after all, exercise is stress. Too much is stress. Um, Some of the Eastern European exercise physiologists long ago uh, discovered that they could improve performance by making their athletes stop exercising. And uh, one of the things that happens is when you stop exercising soon enough, your testosterone and pregnenolone and DHEA levels rise and so they were accused of, of doping them. But mm. if, if you just stop exercise early enough, uh, the, um, the muscle activity, for example, lifting a dumbbell just a few times will uh, cause your muscles to produce testosterone and other androgens such as the AGA. So the muscle becomes a, a steroidogenic gland when it's properly stimulated. Mm. And and not forced to the point where it starts making lactic acid. So, so high intensity, say two sets of dumbbells to failure and then resting for three days would probably be more effective than doing cardio for four or five times a week. And since the mitochondrion is the source of steroid production, you have to <clears throat> take good care of the mitochondria, which... Um, in the type of exercise you do, ideally it should be mostly concentric exercise, meaning uh, load while shortening and no load while uh, relaxing and lengthening the muscle. And that would mean uh, running upstairs and sliding down the banister or mm -hmm. riding a bicycle uphill and coasting down. Uh, so you get uh, the loaded 
contracting muscle and the unloaded relaxing muscle. But in the gym, if they were just doing weights, that would look like bicep curls, tricep extensions. It, it would be um, lifting the weight and dropping it, which isn't polite. So they they, oh, have, okay. machines, they have machines designed to uh, basically let you drop the weight after lifting it. Oh, there are some people actually do that at the gym, and I thought that was just that um, they were just fed up with the exercise. Now I realize it's it's part of part yeah, of the some, concentric force. Yes. Yeah, some exercise physiologists found that old people who seem to have deteriorated, basically non-functioning mitochondria in their muscles, after a few weeks of doing only concentric exercise, they had brand new mitochondria. Mm. So the bottom line is to do less when it comes to intense exercise. Less is more. Uh, yeah, or or more of the right kind than none of the wrong kind of activity. Exactly. So you studied linguistics, which is kind of like was your first priority to do your PhD? Uh, yeah, I, I got as far as, as um, working on my dissertation on um, the... It was closely related to the Forfian hypothesis that language limits the way we think, and so I was comparing uh, the um, structures and and ways of people used Chinese and German and English uh, and, and showing that uh, people could think more efficiently about certain subjects in Chinese and English than in, in German or Hindi. And, yes. Uh, um, the, the decisive thing that made me uh, shift to uh, first brain biology and then reproductive biology was I submitted a, a paper uh, to a journal and uh, the editor said uh, they accepted it, but they wanted a clarification of a little remark I made about Noam Chomsky's linguistics. And when I expanded the paragraph, it was clear that I was criticizing uh, Chomsky's view of language, which was that it's genetic and and uh, sort of absolute, and that uh, there's no uh, alternative except to think in language. And the editor said, "Oh, but you've criticized Chomsky. We can't publish that." And I saw that uh, the linguistics culture was was really just a cult, in which mm. at that time uh, Chomsky's linguistics happened to be. Uh, like he was the pope of of linguistic theory, and then when I began studying brain biology, I found that uh, the brain biologists had a similar authoritarian hierarchy, in which you uh, you had to uh, think in terms of uh, tape recording uh, circuitry and uh, membrane all or nothing cell function and so on uh, certain. Uh, stereotype dogmas. If you didn't do that, you couldn't be a brain biologist. And uh, at that point, I, I looked around and decided to become a reproductive physiologist because uh, they were the least dogmatic of the mm. biology community. And how was your thesis received at the time on progesterone in '72? Oh, well, uh, I, I don't think uh, professors usually uh, devote much time to, to thinking about their students' work. Uh, mm -hmm. In my, my master's thesis on uh, William Blake, for example, uh, it circulated among my committee for uh, around six or seven months, and I found when I got it back approved that the typist had left out paragraphs <laughs> and no one had noticed. And, in my PhD dissertation, there was really only one one criticism out of the whole committee, and uh, uh, that was something that I just explained uh, repeatedly, and, and the professor uh, finally understood my point, and uh, really, no one really paid attention to the mm. basic thesis very much. So, uh, in, in your experience, 
experience, and you've obviously had lots of them and vast research, is there such a thing, Raymond, as a scientific fact? And if there is, what would it be? Uh, well, the um, people mean different things when they say fact, but I think that there is such a thing as a, a, a fact, which is the experience, the actual uh, mm. substance <clears throat> that is perceived. But then we live in a world of meaning, and those perceptions, it's sort of like the gestalt psychology um, illustrations. Um, they have pictures of um, ambiguous figures, uh, profiles and a vase, or a young girl and an old hag uh, in which some people will see one figure mm -hmm. and others will see the other. Um, that process of imposing meaning on those experiential facts, uh, you can have an absolutely uh, clear experience, an, an event that happens, and then different people will interpret it and impose their meaning on it differently. Uh, and that's where the um, uh, science becomes r very much the same situation I was studying in linguistics. Mm. Uh, we live in a universe of meaning, which for most people is nothing but the culture and the language that they grew up uh, knowing. And and so uh, we can, uh, and 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 I can experience a situation, and I'll tend to agree with the ant more than I'll agree with with a biologist or a physicist. Mm. Uh, so the more uh, languages we speak, or the more concepts we understand, the more ways we see the world, the more meaning we have. Um, yeah, uh, there have been studies comparing uh, the intelligent behavior of uh, polylingual uh, kids and uh, bilingual kids really are more intelligent than monolingual kids uh, because they somewhat get out of the uh, rigid way of of perceiving the world that uh, that um, one language gives. And by the age of three, people are already uh, getting into that authoritarian, habituated frame of mind so that uh, monkeys at the age of uh, the same age as a, a three-year-old kid will behave uh, more intelligently at solving some kinds of problems than the child because the child is already uh, using linguistic uh, mm. preconceived ideas where the, the, uh, the monkey or the ant or, or whatever animal that doesn't have language uh, we'll look at the situation freshly. Yes, and, and the whole um, world and understanding of linguistics and seeing the world through the description of the language you speak deserves at least another hour. So, um, Raymond, is there a question I have not asked you that you would have liked to answer? Oh, uh, nothing occurs to me. Okay, then it was a very thorough, engaging conversation we had. I certainly could have asked you a lot more questions, and I find that your knowledge is so in-depth that I do probably need to read your articles twice or three times. And I often recommend people to visit your website and to acquaint themselves with the bottom line information to cipher through a lot of irrelevancies that we find in the world of information or infoglut. And your website is www.raypeat.com. That's Ray Pete with P E A T. Ray, it's been really a pleasure talking to you. And um, you were put on the hot seat, and you've done a marvelous job. And I'd like to thank you, and okay. um, have a great day. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye for now. And I'd like to thank Monica Brown for her wonderful contribution from Amaya's production. And um, till next time, in wellness to your health.